Hey guys, welcome to the Asian Hustle Network podcast. My name is Brian. And my name is Maggie. And we interview Asian entrepreneurs around the world to amplify their voices and empower Asians to pursue their dreams and goals. We believe that each person has a message and a unique story from their entrepreneurial journey that they can share with all of us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Asian Hustle Network podcast. Today, we have a very special guest. His name is Jay Wei, and he was born and raised in the Bay Area. Both of his parents are Taiwanese. He played NCAA Division I in basketball as well as professional basketball in Taiwan. Jay co-founded Ubeek, a tech company based in Taipei focusing on long-range wireless technologies, IoT. He also dabbles in TikTok and has grown his platform to over 600,000 followers in less than six months. Jay, welcome to the show. Thank you guys for having me. Maggie, Brian, appreciate you guys. Yeah, we're super excited to have you here today. I mean, we got to just dive right into it. What was your upbringing like and how did you end up having such an awesome career and everything? <laughs> I wouldn't say it was awesome career. I definitely had its, its hiccup and ups and downs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess we'll start from when I was a kid. So I was born and raised in the Bay Area, like, like you mentioned. And um, born uh, originally, uh, my friend group was all Asian Americans, fellow Asian Americans, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean. Mm-hmm. Um, and growing up, I always liked playing basketball. So here's my first story of, of my basketball experience. So I've always played um, basketball at a competitive level since I was maybe in fourth grade. Mm-hmm. And um, going into middle school, as you guys all know, a lot of elementary schools combine and go into a larger middle school and everyone's meeting everyone. And my first encounter with racism happened in middle school. Oh, so wow. um, every morning there would be one basketball court where all the cool kids, all the cool kids played and all the girls kind of um, watched these, these, these athletes play. Mm-hmm. And when I, the first day of middle school, I went to go try to play with these kids and they were predominantly Caucasians. Mm-hmm. And given my background, given my experience of basketball, I thought that I would be allowed to play, but these kids would not let me play. Oh, wow. <laughs> they found out my name was Jay way and they said gay way no gay way uh-huh. you can't play with us that was the most devastating experience for me and um it's something that actually i really have very negative thoughts to this day about mm-hmm. and, and it has kind of carried throughout my whole career of having this chip on my shoulder and being insecure mm-hmm. so that experience of racism and just i guess kind of bullying kind of shaped me to be very determined to prove people wrong. Mm -hmm. So actually in middle school, um, before that incident, I was playing, playing at simultaneously around seven to eight competitive basketball teams at once. There's a lot. Yeah. Including traveling teams and teams that were sponsored by Adidas or our travel expenses, our food are expensive, were paid for. We travel all across the U S and play other people. And then going to a middle school where no one knew me and then giving this type of type of treatment was just eye opening for me. Mm-hmm. Right. So then fast forward to middle school tryouts, uh, middle school basketball team tryouts. As a sixth grader, I actually made the seventh grade basketball team. Mm-hmm. And wow. overnight, it was a 180 of treatment. The next day, I was immediately allowed to play basketball on this court. Mm-hmm. And that type of dynamic really shifted my thoughts of, okay, what does basketball mean to my identity? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. These kids, these Caucasian kids originally did not let me play. And now because they think I'm good at basketball, all of a sudden I'm welcome. Mm -hmm. So originally in their eyes, I was a nobody. And all of a sudden I'm someone that can be their friend, someone that could be looked up to and uh, respected. So I think that was one of my driving forces throughout my whole career is that basketball can allow me to rise in the social hierarchy here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I trained incredibly hard with my dad. We would put countless hours in morning and late nights, just training. And um, I guess we kind of trained with this uh, mentality of paranoia. Mm -hmm. I guess it was kind of instilled in me by my father, just saying like, no matter how hard you work, there's always someone in some other state, in some other country who was working just as hard, if not harder. Mm -hmm. Every time I felt like we were working out, we, I had to do a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And, um, that type of worth ethic 
brought me to a certain level where I was able to play in high school at a very competitive high school uh, mm -hmm. called Archbishop Midi in San Jose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a really good high school for basketball. Yeah, that team when I was there was very, it was playing at a very high level. So we, my graduating senior class had seven division one basketball players. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, at our peak, we were ranked number two in the nation by USA Today, ESPN. And um, it was, it was a good career. It was a solid career. We had a very great record. I think we lost maybe three times in my three or four times in my four years or three years there Crazy. In, in playing varsity. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the, the star athlete on that team was familiar with Aaron Gordon. I played with Aaron Gordon's older brother. Okay. Yeah. He That's was crazy. a extreme athlete as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so my career was very fruitful in, in high school, but mm -hmm. senior year, I actually came down with a, a serious injury. Mm -hmm. I injured my foot and uh, I had a, a bone contusion in my foot. Mm -hmm. So I was out for maybe six months and a lot of the colleges I was talking to, um, it, they, they treated it like a business when they found out I was injured, they just stopped talking to me, wow. which was really another harsh blow to my ego as well. Mm -hmm. So I've, it was always a childhood dream to play division one basketball, mm -hmm. but out of high school, I was given zero offers or the offers were retracted because of my injury. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going the division two route to begin with. So I signed to play at uh, university of California, San Diego, UC San Diego. Mm -hmm. And I played there for two years. And, um, how I ended up in division one was I actually, um, reached out to another division one basketball school mm -hmm. and my division two coach actually found out and was very upset. Wow. So obviously I didn't, I didn't, I didn't handle that in the most mature manner as I reflect on it, mm -hmm. but in my heart, all I wanted to do was play at the most competitive level. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, when my coach found out that I was talking to other, other, uh, teams, he, I thought he also handled it in a very vicious manner where he called me into his office mm -hmm. and said, Hey Jay, I heard that you are thinking about playing division one basketball. Well, obviously I'm just <laughs> <laughs> And this, this was also a scarring moment for me because this was my first kind of interaction with the very sensitive matter and to have an adult speak to me in a very vicious tone was, was also, um, yeah. scarring for me. He told me you're not a division one basketball player. I don't know who you think you are. Wow. wow. And, um, I don't want to cuss on this, but he said, get the F out of my office. You're off the team. Mm -hmm. So that was his response. Wow. So I was kicked off the team before I joined, accepted the offer to play at university of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I got the uh, honor to play under coach Rex Walters, who is a previous NBA player who played six years, including uh, the Miami heat, Philadelphia 76ers. He was just an awesome coach. And he is actually the, the true first Asian American to play in the NBA. Mm -hmm. He's half Japanese and um, just an awesome, awesome role model. So, wow. That is one heck of a childhood and, and early basketball career, you know, and I do admire that your dad instilled in you such a mm -hmm. strong work, work habit. And we see that in everything you do, you know, you, mm -hmm. especially with TikTok and your tech company, like that mentality like we've been following you on TikTok since you were at 10K. Really? Yeah. yeah. So we actually know a lot about you, Jay. <laughs> I remember the first TikTok that we saw was about the blood center and you oh, donating blood to the no, blood center. Even earlier in that, when he's talking about overseas basketball. Yeah. Trying yeah. on different things. And we're just like, who is this guy? He's so funny. Yeah. At that point, we haven't taken, Maggie and I haven't taken seriously. Uh, TikTok that seriously yet so we're just looking at, at like other Asian American creators mm -hmm. as inspiration and you came up you know we saw your basketball mm -hmm. career yeah and originally when you posted your, your TikTok videos about your basketball career we thought it was satire like we're like mm -hmm. there's no way Asian you gotta play basketball. <laughs> <laughs> but then ironically that's how we found you you know mm -hmm. we found your name and your team <laughs> we're like, wait he's legit mm -hmm. <laughs> that's awesome and it's crazy to hear about your struggles too and 
you know, what your coach said to you was really messed up, you know? Mm-hmm. That unfortunately it happens a lot in everything that we do in life, especially entrepreneurship. A lot of people say that you can or cannot do certain things, but mainly you get to decide that you can do it. No one else can say anything about that, mm-hmm. you know? So yep. I do admire that about you. Yeah, and I think that a lot of people take advantage of the fact that we are Asian too, mm-hmm. and it makes people think that we are submissive and you know we don't want to create chaos, so they take advantage of that, right? But you, you know, you knew your potential and you knew that you could do it in your own sense. And so you, you know, went out there to reach your goals. I really appreciate that. Yeah. So was that transition like into college basketball and Mm -hmm. professional basketball overseas? So from college basketball, an agent just reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to uh, play for a team out there. And Mm -hmm. I kind of blindly signed a contract Mm -hmm. and I flew out there and the quality and level of sophistication of basketball overseas, I think is much different uh, mm-hmm. overseas than it is the U S I think when you're playing division one basketball in the U S it's the cream of the crop. You have the best resources. Um, you're getting the access to all the best amenities and facilities. And I was shocked to land in Taiwan mm-hmm. and arrive to my first practice. And um, I remember there was players waiting for the gym to open or allowed to go in the gym. And I was asking them, oh, can we go in there and shoot around early? And they said, no, there's a, a middle school um, volleyball practice going on. Mm-hmm. So this professional basketball <laughs> team wow. was sharing a middle school basketball court uh, or a, a, a gymnasium mm-hmm. uh, with, the, with the middle school. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I remember arriving there in summer, it was like 105 degrees, like including a humidity, it felt like 110. Mm-hmm. And this middle school did not have air conditioning. It, it was absurd to me. And the thing is the facilities in the middle school were very, very subpar. Mm-hmm. So I could just see that the, there was a huge lack of resources mm-hmm. in basketball, professional basketball compared to even college basketball in the U S. Mm-hmm. So that was a big letdown. And also for, for division one basketball, they had us living in very nice dorms um, in the city with our own kitchen living room, everything. And when I went there, they had us living in dorms with a roommate Mm -hmm. um, and shared bathrooms. So it was nothing luxurious. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And and a big thing is that uh, in the U S when you tell people you're playing professional basketball, they have this huge, uh, this, this uh, misconception that it's exactly like the U S these people are gods that they, people really look up to them Uh and they're doing big things. There's a huge a dynamic shift in society mindset in, in Taiwan and Asia where people actually sometimes look down on athletes because wow. what's praised in, in, the, in the U.S. or in, in Taiwan specifically mm-hmm. is that uh, you go to a very good school academically. Right. Mm-hmm. So it was funny to me when I, would, when I would be walking around Taiwan thinking that I was somebody and someone asked me what I do and I said, oh, I play professional basketball. And their face is like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> their, 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 their mindset is like, oh, this guy didn't study hard enough. And yeah, now yeah, he has yeah. to be an athlete and play basketball <laughs> and, and be in a non-air conditioned basketball court. all day. <laughs> And it was, it's exactly that. And it really, though, you can see a lot of players that um, play basketball in Taiwan. This is not everyone, but they just didn't have a choice. They were maybe gifted athletically and maybe coaches kind of corralled them into sports. Mm-hmm. But right now when they're, 27, 30 years old, and they want to get out of the, that, that bubble, they can't. And it's, mm-hmm. that's a, another tough part of. Quick question uh, though. This is before Jeremy Lin or after Jeremy Lin? This is, so I'm two years younger than Jeremy Lin. Mm-hmm. And a fun fact is I grew up playing against Jeremy Lin since uh-huh. I was like 12. So we were always on different teams. Mm-hmm. Um, Yes. And <laughs> you could always, a fun, a fun story about Jeremy Lin is we always knew Jeremy Lin was a little bit different in, in a good way uh-huh. is that when we were young, when we played basketball, it was more for fun, you know, mm-hmm. as long as no one got injured or died, we were just like, okay, cool. What where are we going <laughs> we to eat as a team after this? Yeah. As a 12 year old, um, when we beat Jeremy Lin's team as, as, as a youth team, uh-huh. Jeremy Lin would sit on the floor and cry. Wow. And his mom would come up to him and try to pull him off the court and he would hit bat away his mom's hand saying that he wants to stay on the court by himself. And all the other 12 year olds, 13 year olds are kind of huddled, huddled around watching Jeremy Lin 
cry and put on a hissy fit being like, what's wrong with this kid? Oh, wow. But then as we grow up, when we reflect on that, that experience, we think like, wow, he was such a competitor. Uh-huh. That was, that was the main difference from us and Jeremy Lin was just this undying competitive where you have to win or, or nothing else matters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's a crazy story to hear. <clears throat> you know, you would think that with Jeremy Lin kind of blazing the trail a little bit in Taiwan, that, you know, professional athletes would have more of respect. So with that story, is like, did you help me before Jeremy or after Jeremy? Because <laughs> I'm a little Yeah, surprised. definitely after. Jeremy definitely had a very, very successful career. Um, actually, in high school, his team won the state championship after beating my high school. So mm-hmm. that, that is crazy. So while you're in Taiwan, how long were you, were you on the basketball team for? And we see that you also started a tech company in Taiwan. Like, how'd you, how'd you manage your time to practice and being a CEO? So I didn't do them simultaneously. So after around two and a half seasons, I stopped playing. Mm-hmm. And um, that was kind of a, a decision to kind of transition away from that lifestyle where I thought that there was a definitely, there was no light at the end of the tunnel. Mm-hmm. Saw so a lot of athletes that, at the time when I was just starting at 21 years old, they were 30, 32 and just retiring and they had no idea what to do. They were thinking about trying to open a restaurant. They were trying to go into coaching, but Mm -hmm. there's so many coaching available, coaching positions available. Mm -hmm. And that type of um, predicament with career really scared me because I thought to myself, what happens when I'm 30 and Mm -hmm. I can't hang with the young kids? Like, do I just try to fight for a coaching job? That seems so Mm -hmm. scary to me. Yeah. So my cousin told me to look around for tech companies in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'd stick around to number one, uh, kind of refine my Chinese because originally when I first landed, I couldn't speak any Chinese or Mm -hmm. understand. So I really wanted to um, work on my Chinese. Mm -hmm. And I ended up finding a semiconductor company there doing international sales. Mm -hmm. And I really spent a lot of time on my Chinese where I could read, write fluently. Mm -hmm. And after a few years at that semiconductor company, I joined a startup company Mm -hmm. doing wireless as well. And uh, I met some really talented engineers there. So I I think a quick backdrop on my mindset of going into business Mm -hmm. was I'm very money motivated. Mm -hmm. Um, One thing that my dad was also um, encouraging me to explore other career paths was he was saying that basketball, the essences of basketball can also be found in different industries. Mm-hmm. So same with business. Cause my dad is a businessman. Okay. Um, if you work hard, your work ethic, you, you are willing to be proactive and, and sociable, you can find success and, and separate yourself from others in the business world. Right. And on top of that, you can make money. Mm-hmm. And that to me was, okay, let's, let's try to make this type of career path work. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I started talking with other engineers and them here, hearing about their ideas, um, specifically a very talented engineer from France was working in, in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. He was talking, he was pitching myself. And at the time, the VP of that uh, startup about a long range technology that would allow devices to have five, 10 years battery life. And it wouldn't be for browsing the internet or watching YouTube. It'd be for these devices that go inside um, industrial items like meters, Mm -hmm. gas meters, water meters. Um, It could be parking spaces. It could be lights. Um, These concepts around internet of things or smart cities. Mm -hmm. And he said that there was a gap in this mark in in the market for the marketplace for this type of technology. So we, myself, the VP and and the uh, CTO are, the that engineer stepped away from the company and started a company on our own Mm -hmm. and uh, we did that in 2016 Mm -hmm. and we and we spent around two and a half years of r&d um developing the protocol and developing the embedded hardware around that and finally getting a proof of concept ready but those two and a half years of r&d were very tough i mean one thing I, I reflect on our initial start of the company and I think it was kind of just blind stupidity and just, there was this impetus 
where we were, all of us just wanted to do our own thing. Mm-hmm. We had the motivation to number one, be independent, which I think a lot of entrepreneurs go for is, okay, I want to be free. Mm-hmm. I don't want to report to the boss anymore. I want to do my own thing. Mm-hmm. And then secondly, when you think about, okay, if this is successful, there could be very nice return. Mm-hmm. So the next stupid thing I did was put in all my savings blindly, just, okay, it's, it'll probably work out. It's just the Silicon Valley <laughs> mindset. Yeah. It's going to work out. Mm-hmm. And uh, the CEO, uh, my partner also put much, much, much more than I did. And we put everything on the line. Wow. And once that kind of romance fairy tale stage ended, which took around a year and a half where we saw a runway of cash burning out. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, that's when reality really set in and we're like, what are we doing? Mm-hmm. We're just burning through money of this idea that we've never really validated. And, um, I remember sitting with my partner late at night, one night in the office and my partner's older, older than me. He mm-hmm. has a family of two kids. And I remember him sitting down in the office, just his hands, his head buried in his hands and just saying, I just ruined my children's future. Like I have no money for them for their education because I spent it all on this company. Mm -hmm. And I remember him saying, okay, we need to move offices and bear in mind that offices in Taiwan are not expensive in the first place. We are spending for a large office space to house maybe 30 to 40 employees. We were spending three, $4,000 a month. And we said, let's, downsize it to something wow. under under 1000. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we moved into this very rickety old building. Is mm-hmm. it next to the 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 basketball court? No. <laughs> unfortunately not. <laughs> no, it was bad. They had, they had cockroaches. Oh, and wow. the worst part is it was only a sh- there was only one shared bathroom and paper thin walls and we had boys and girls in our, our males and females in our company. So if anyone goes in the bathroom, you can hear everything that takes place oh, inside yeah. the bathroom. <laughs> so well, it, that's, how, that's how you build a, a team bonding experience. Right? <laughs> oh, team yeah. bonding, right? That is the definition <laughs> of team just... bonding. Yeah. Expedited team bonding. Yeah. Um, cool. But right, so after those very, that very rocky start, we actually got the product out. Mm-hmm. And then, um, Still, uh, when we thought we launched the technology, we thought that everyone would be just going crazy for it and mm-hmm. money would be flying in. And we launched it. We did marketing stuff and we did trade shows. Mm-hmm. And it was like crickets chirping. There was nothing. Mm-hmm. So we were discussing how we would uh, kind of close up, potentially close up the company, even start maybe discussing how we downsize the company. Mm-hmm. And we decided to participate in Taiwan's largest government tender at the time. Mm-hmm. So initially in Taiwan, um, for the electricity meters, they used to send physically employees to go write down the meters mm-hmm. and how much energy you use. And then they bill you for it. Right. So Taiwan said, okay, for our 20, for our 3.5, 4.5 million meters across the country, we want to use wireless. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to be using um, um, if you, if you, if you put a SIM card in every single meter, that means like you're paying a, a monthly fee for every single meter. So they want to build out their own infrastructure. So they wanted some type of very long range wireless technology. And we had the exact perfect fit for that, mm-hmm. that, uh, technology. Mm-hmm. So we applied for the tender and the tender was, I mean, it's for, it's a multi million dollar uh, volume tender. So you had other publicly traded companies fly in from all over the world to participate tender. And in total for the introduction meeting for this government tender, there was 12 um, companies, publicly traded companies, huge conglomerates that came to bid. And then there was us, Ubik, mm-hmm. like a 22 person team that showed up to this meeting. <laughs> and um, during this meeting, the, the representatives of the Taiwan power electricity company made it very clear. They kind of hinted at us like, are you guys sure you want to participate in this tender? It's a serious tender. (laughs) (laughs) And we're like, yeah, yeah, we want to, we want a shot. And then they tried to kind of scare us away by saying like, there's a bunch of um, milestones during this testing phase that if you don't meet, like you guys get fined. In in fact, like you guys, 
we don't think that you guys would even survive any of the fines. Mm-hmm. But we were really persistent at saying, okay, well, this is our last shot. If mm-hmm. we don't make it, then it's, then it's fine. Mm-hmm. And we end this testing and trial phase took around 13 months wow. of side-by-side comparison with the other 12 vendors. Mm-hmm. And our technology was proven to be the most scalable in that we use the least amount of base stations to connect the most amount of meters. Mm-hmm. And it was the most reliable. And we're guaranteeing like 99.5% success rate. So after 13 months, they announced us, a company no one has heard of as a winner. Yeah. And that completely 180 our our, uh, our, our growth. So instead of going this way, we started going this way. (laughs) Congratulations. We we love that story of hustle, perseverance, and belief. Cause you know, we we're running Asian hustle network now. It's basically Mm -hmm. a startup and we're burning your cash like crazy as well. We're like, Oh my God. Yeah. That's why I really resonated with your story. (laughs) It sounded very much like us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to make a turning point right now. Our, we have our mission statement is, you know, we're trying to support the Asian community around the world and we see a lot of support and being able to reach out with people like yourself, hearing your story too, makes us feel like we're not alone in this mm-hmm. journey. Definitely not alone. Yeah. 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 I'm pretty sure a lot of people listening to this podcast as well are feeling the same way, except mm-hmm. that like Asian culture, we don't express ourselves. We don't go out to yeah. tell our friends, Hey man, I'm so sad today. My company's doing bad. Yeah. You know, that's the last yeah. thing we're going to say to our friends. Our friends yeah. asked us, hey, man, how's your company doing? It's doing good. <laughs> you know? Yeah, Asian culture is all about saving face. I know exactly. a lot of us don't even like to ask for help. So it's yes. like we always act like everything's fine. But I'm the opposite, though. I, like, I ask for help. <laughs> hey, man, I'm drowning. I need help. <laughs> Me, too. <laughs> Me too. But I completely understand the dynamic of culture where we'd like to save face. Right. Yeah. And one thing, especially in Asian American culture, is that I've, I, I feel like there's certain, uh, how do you explain this? Well, when I, when I see other cultures, how they interact in the business place, it seems like they're very supportive. I, I see like my, my brothers, my mom's coworkers, they're, they're predominantly Indian American. Mm-hmm. They are so proactively supportive and trying to pull each other up mm-hmm. where I feel like in some certain dynamics or scenarios, you see Asian Americans trying to push, push, push each other down yeah. and compete with one another yeah. and try to save face in front of other ethnicities where their their Caucasian boss, their Indian boss, they're trying to separate themselves from the other Asian American colleagues. Yeah. Where I'm really hoping that the dynamic shifts where we're just like them, where we're kind of constantly bolstering each other up. Yeah. That would be the the new vibe and trend that I would be trying to yeah. be an advocate of. That's exactly where our mission statement is. Exactly. You know, mm-hmm. and we notice that too. Like we our culture is rooted in competition. Mm-hmm. Like since ever since we're growing up against our siblings or cousins, whatnot. Yeah. You always have to be the best. And that yeah. translates to most of our adult life. It's mm-hmm. like, uh, uh, what if I'm not the best? I'm going to start dragging people down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's not mentality to have neither. Yeah. And looking into like Asian Americans, like we're pretty fragmented in general. Um, when you think about it, we're basically separated by one generation of war. Like our parents mm-hmm. are fighting against, our grandparents are fighting against each other at some point yeah. in all of their lives. Yeah. And for us, having an Asian identity right now is completely new. And mm-hmm. that's the why we started Asian Hustle Network to kind of unite everyone under one umbrella and really uplift each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but yeah. I think a, big, I mean, a big step to that is, um, like, like Maggie said, is that it, the, the saving face mentality is really dangerous. It is. Right. And um, one way we can kind of take a huge leap f- uh, with every interaction that we get to is mm-hmm. kind of, show our weeks, our weakness to other people immediately show, like share our insecurities. Yeah. Like the reason why I started with that story of racism is because to this day, I'm still very insecure. Mm-hmm. Um, I honestly have trouble establishing honest, genuine relationships with Caucasians because mm-hmm. I feel like they're still looking down on me mm-hmm. and I'm very insecure about that. Mm-hmm. Um, that's stuff I, I battle with day in and day out when I'm here in the U S and the interesting thing about my experience is that when I've flown back to Taiwan, I lived in Taiwan for eight years. Mm. That was my first experience ever walking around the street and feeling like I'm just a guy mm-hmm. without a title of ethnicity. Where here in the U.S., I'm always the Asian guy, mm-hmm. that Chinese guy on the basketball team, that Asian guy, your Asian friend. Mm-hmm. I've never been just a guy. Yeah. So even though I've never, I've, I was born here in the U.S., this is... I have U.S. citizenship, 
every time I go home, oh, every time I go back to Taiwan and I touch down in the Taoyuan airport, I feel like I've landed back at home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't hope, I don't wish that on any other Asian Americans where they feel like they need to leave the country to feel like they're at home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good perspective. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, something to know as well. Like, I, I'm very happy to hear that from you because some people in America, they, especially in America, they don't feel like they're at home in either places, right? In America or their motherland, because they feel like once they go back to their motherland, they can tell, people can tell that you're not from there. You're not a native. I don't belong right? anywhere now. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then if they go back to America, it's always like that one Asian person, right? And for you to feel like you found a home when you go back to to you know Taiwan, it's you know a really special feeling to have. Yeah, and also Su- Mikasa, e- Su- Kasa, so we're also in the Bay. Come over anytime. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> so, just just a quick fu- fun question. You know, we saw you on a Taiwanese dating show. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> so when I stopped playing basketball, uh-huh. um, my colleagues all found out that I didn't have any friends. Cause all I did was play basketball and then I moved to a city like 45 minutes down South of Taipei. So it's equivalent to Taipei is San Francisco. And then Sunnyvale is the place oh, okay. I, I, I moved to like a Shinzu super boring. <laughs> Nobody's there. Every, everyone's an engineer. And I just basically mm-hmm. spent my weekends by myself. Uh-huh. So my colleagues originally tricked me saying, Oh, you should go on a, a talk show for ABCs and meet other ABCs. And I had no idea what was going on. And they signed me up for this show and they said, Oh, I'm on, you should go. <laughs> um, it's not until like three days before I agreed and uh, three days before they were going to record the show that I found out it was a dating show. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, yeah, I went on that show and um, my Chinese was pretty much little to non-existent. Mm-hmm. And during rehearsal, the employees of the show, the helpers of the show, like quickly, realized and started panicking like this guy's Chinese is not good enough to like be on this show. (laughs) Actually a fun fact is a lot of the stuff I was saying was all like pre-rehearsed. Oh wow. Um, And a lot of the questions that the, the, uh, the two uh, celebrity hosts were asking me, I didn't understand. So they, I had to pause and they cut that out and they had to like run up and like explain to me what they're saying. (laughs) And then I'd respond. A lot of the responses you see in that show where the girls are trying to interact with me and I'm just smiling and nodding <laughs> because I don't understand what's going on. <laughs> and, um, yeah, in the end, if you watch the show, yeah, I, I was paired with a girl and mm-hmm. we just became friends after that. Is that your girlfriend uh, currently? No, Is that Sharon. No, that's not Sharon. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. We just went on a couple dates, but just decided to just keep it platonic and just be mm-hmm. friends. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And on that note, how did you meet Sharon? Yeah, we well, go back up a little bit though, because yeah. ABC means Asian born Chinese for those that don't know. What oh, right. I'm using that so, like so. Yeah. Got, American born Chinese. Oh, American, <laughs> Asian born. Oh, American born. <laughs> yeah. Chinese. Yeah. So. Yeah. So how did you meet Sharon? And, you know, we've seen Sharon in a lot of your TikToks. And for our listeners, go check out Jay on his TikTok channel. It's Jay and <laughs> Sharon. Um, but, you know, Sharon is in a lot of your videos. And, you know, you guys seem like such an amazing pair. How did you guys, how did you guys meet? So last year I was um, part of an incubator program in, in the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did a, there was a bunch of pitch events at this shared office called plug and play. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And on one of these events during one of the pitches, Sharon actually went to go randomly listen in. And if you hear her side of the story, she was just bored and just trying to listen into new ideas. Mm-hmm. And she was just in the crowd. Wow. And after every pitch event, there's like 10 pitches, 10 startups that give their pitch. Um, you basically line up for food. And <laughs> I coincidentally lined up behind her and just started talking to her. And that's how we actually met. And our first impression and first conversation, um, she was pretty cold and didn't really, she was pretty much ignoring me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All we did was exchange LinkedIn information Uh and didn't really speak after that. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until this year when I flew back to the US in March and then quarantine happened. 
And you should go the other way. <laughs> yeah, I know. I went the wrong way. Right when I landed, <laughs> right when I landed, 48 hours after I landed, they were saying, okay, now it's shelter in place. Uh-huh. All the meetings were canceled. Plane tickets were, were uh, my plane tickets just were kind of invalid because I couldn't go back. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I decided just to stay here. And it was really depressing to mm-hmm. begin with. Yeah. Initially, I was free. I had my, my friend circle in, in mm-hmm. Taiwan. Mm-hmm. And then I moved back here and I was just all alone. So I went through like, what, two and a half months of just being alone and trying to survive. And mm-hmm. I, I guess you could say I was pretty, pretty much depressed. And I just randomly reached out to Sharon on LinkedIn mm-hmm. and asked her if she wanted to go on hiking. Mm-hmm. And that's how it started. Wow. And then we noticed that your TikTok activity picked up in June and July. So you guys are literally dating, early stage dating, and they started making a TikTok together. How does this idea come about? Yeah, what yeah. did she think about it? And oh, whose who's crazy idea was it? It was actually Sharon. This TikTok was all Sharon's idea. Really? Oh, wow. She was, wow. He was just saying, hey, we should just, just record some TikTok just for fun. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I was completely separated from social media. Mm-hmm. I didn't post, I haven't posted anything on social media yeah. uh, before that since 2011. Wow. So I didn't touch social media. Nine years. Uh, yeah. Nine years without social media. And then all of a sudden Sharon is telling me, oh, just, just for fun. No one's going to, she said, no one's going to see it anyways. That was a <laughs> quote. It's true. Right? <laughs> you know, zero followers on TikTok. So she's like, no one's going to see it. Let's just make some funny videos. And we start recording. And then we start looking at the notifications and I'm like, people are watching this. <laughs> How is this happening? <laughs> and then the, as the views started growing, I just became more, um, when you have, when you feel like you have an audience that, that kind of appreciates your humor, you kind of get inclined to say, okay, I, I want to show them more of what I have to offer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And to rewind way back when I was young, I've always liked writing jokes. So since I was in middle school, I kept a little notebook of jokes. Yeah. Funny stuff that I thought about. I'd write about old people, teachers, everything. Every, I'd have little, yeah. little notes and poems as well. And a fun fact is when I, was in, when I was 15, I took my brother's ID and I went to downtown San Jose and I snuck into an open mic night oh, wow. uh, for, stand-up, for stand-up comedy. And... Um, I got there with my little notebook and I was like, okay, this is my day to shine. I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it big. <laughs> I just sat there and I was too nervous as a 15 year old. Uh-huh. Yeah. Everyone looks so intimidating. Everyone looks so old. And even the, the, uh, the host went up to me and said, Oh, did you want to do a set? And I looked at him and said, uh, no, uh, no, uh, no, not at all. <laughs> Completely chickened out. So I, after listening to the whole mic open mic night, I just went home. Um, so yeah, in essence, I've always wanted to uh, do stand-up comedy or, or mm-hmm. comedy. Mm-hmm. And I've grown up watching a lot of stand-up comedy when I was a kid. So starting this TikTok and starting to create this comedic content on my free time mm-hmm. has just been kind of an awakening to like remembering what I was like when I was a kid of writing these jokes down. And when I write TikToks down, I actually, I still write it in a notebook and yeah. write down the the lines of each, everything I say and say right. like, okay, this would be funny. And then this line was a buildup and then this would be the joke. And it's very structured how I write a TikTok. You know, it just sounds like I'm just talking. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I was just going to, my next question was going to be like, how are you, how are you so creative? Yeah, like, who, who has the like comedy humor side of you? Like, was it Jay or Sharon? But you just answered my question. And for so you- Sharon is also really funny. But, and the wow. thing is, Sharon thinks I'm, since this, this TikTok kicked off, Sharon thinks I'm kind of crazy. Cause I'm constantly writing. I will like see a mailman walk by and I'll just stare at him and blank out for five minutes and then pick up my phone and start writing down some jokes. I thought about looking at the mailman. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Inspiration. Yeah. I mean, we try to do the same thing except that we realize that we're not funny people. <laughs> every time, every time we make a funny video, we get like five views. Like, damn it. We're not that's, funny. That's really good advice like, to write it down. Like maybe we should start writing down our skits. <laughs> yeah. But in, I just want to point out like for you to go to a stand comedy at the age of 15, Shout even, even if you didn't have the guts to go up to the stage, 
for you to like take that first step and go inside and walk into this, those doors, that takes a lot of courage because yeah. you knew you wanted to do that. And that was like one of your dreams. Yeah. And now you have the outlet to actually, you know, express yourself. So that's amazing. I, I always think that life works in really funny ways. Mm-hmm. You know, like what yeah. we want to do and the career path that we choose always takes us to where what we wanted to be originally as a kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think that's the most ironic thing because mm-hmm. my career path has always been kind of wild as well. I mean, I used to wrestle back in college, became a software engineer, became a real estate investor. And then when I was younger, I always wanted to dip my hands into politics. But I'm like, oh, wait, there's no money in this. So I became an engineer. But now I'm like deep into helping other people's political campaigns, you know, all this stuff. I think life works in really funny ways. You know, you always Mm -hmm. go back in the path that you always originally intended for yourself. And for you, that's comedy, you know? And great work on all your videos too. Like mm-hmm. we've been watching the last three weeks. <laughs> we've been blowing up like crazy with, with the whole Costco and the hot dog skits. <laughs> the glizzy one. Yeah. yeah. So, so hat, hats off to you, man. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. So what has been your biggest lesson so far, you know, doing TikTok and just, you know, blowing up, you know, go Not getting into like yeah, basketball, and, and basketball and, you know, co-founding your, your company, you geek, what has been your biggest lesson? Um, and were there any challenges that you've had? Um, so I would say the root or the foundation of what keeps me going is actually my faith. So I'm Christian. Mm-hmm. So I think throughout my whole career, I've, I've really felt God really holding my hand through every obstacle Mm -hmm. and every twist and turn that sounds like a huge jump and jump. It really didn't feel like a jump at the time. It really was a smooth transition. Mm -hmm. I feel like it was really God holding my hand saying, okay, Jay, this will make sense. This will be fine. Mm -hmm. And, and it's funny how it's kind of come full circle, as you mentioned to back to comedy, back to an original passion of mine. Um, where initially when I was first starting or just leaving basketball and other young basketball players or other uh, people that were asking me for advice Mm -hmm. uh, were talking about their passion. I was almost saying like giving them advice around saying it's, you don't always change, chase your passion because it doesn't always work out. Right. I chased basketball. It didn't work out. And now I'm in this position. And then eight years later, I'm back saying the same cliche message. Like actually, going after your passion is still what makes you in the end truly fulfilling and happy. Mm -hmm. Um, Even through the, the heyday or the, the huge success stories that my startup has, Mm -hmm. um, I still wake up with a different type of demeanor and passion and vigor since I had this platform to make people smile and laugh. Yeah. That to me is a different type of happiness than money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's such a cliche. And I'm upset I'm saying that because initially <laughs> I was like, that's, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of gone full circle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I definitely feel you in that statement too. I mean, very similar story. Early, my early twenties, mid twenties, I was such a hung, money hungry person. Uh, I'm like, money's everything, money's happiness you're unhappy because you don't have money <laughs> you know? <laughs> type, type of person. But after a while you realize that is this all there is to life? Just working, mm-hmm. just making money, just you know, buying nice things, quote unquote, but it doesn't make you feel satisfied. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's part of the reasons why we started Asian Hustle Network too, because the more business that we're doing, we realize that Asian people are not only underrepresented, we don't even like to help each other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we're just like, hmm. This maybe this is a passion of ours to like help our community, you know, look into each other and uplift each other. That was mm-hmm. our our why. And you know, to get even more personal, like we went through a year of depression before Asian Hustle Network because we were so lost. We didn't know what to do with our lives, you know. Because we were blessed to get to a point in business where it was going really well. People were asking us, like, I wanna be just like you, I wanna do this and that. But you give them answers that sounds really good. But when you go home, lay down on your pillow, you just feel empty. Yeah. Like, is that really my life's calling? It's just making money, mm-hmm. you know? And then you want to do something bigger, you know? For you, you found TikTok. Mm-hmm. For us, we're trying to find TikTok, but we found Asian Hustle Network first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to emphasize that. I don't think that it's not the essence of TikTok. It's just more of 
a platform where you can share your passion. Right. Yeah. Because right, right. I, I still don't think that I still think that there's a lot of things I dislike about TikTok. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Strongly, strongly dislike. Yeah. yeah. And I wish that I was on a different platform, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. Um, I just have to happen to be blessed with this specific platform. Yeah. yeah. And one thing you touched upon is that gets you in a very dark stage is when you start idolizing idolizing things when you start idolizing sports when you start Mm -hmm. idolizing money when this becomes your only foundation Mm -hmm. of who you are that's what really starts spinning out of control in the long term i don't think it lasts but when you say that your foundation is helping others and bringing other bringing other asian americans up Mm -hmm. that's the foundation also of of my my faith as as a christian right Mm -hmm. people try to overcomplicate Christianity with so many different things, but the essence is just love God, mm-hmm. love your neighbor. And that's it. There's no, no other rule book. That's very true. And your foundation as well is to love on others and to try to bring other people up. If that is your true essence, like this mm-hmm. is something that can, can keep you and sustain you for a really long time. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I admire true. that in you guys as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, and likewise, I absolutely agree with you. I think that some people fall into this perception where they have to succeed in this one role because they think that that's what their passion is. But if you like take away that one role, they won't have anything else. Right. So, you know, look into what your purpose is, like look into your why, like what makes you happy and what makes you, you know, wake up in the morning every single day, you know, and like for most of the people, that's why so many successful people, when they actually do become successful, money is like so irrelevant, irrelevant to them. And yeah. that's why they want to help other people because that's really where their passion lies, right? Absolutely. Not with like their business, not with like with this one company that they've co-founded. It's with helping people and helping, you know, other, you know, people live successful lives. Yeah. 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 I mean, I absolutely agree. And yeah. I mean, you appreciate your humor and your platform a lot. Um, how do you, it's out of curiosity, you know, you mentioned, you know, you find inspiration throughout your day to day, but how do you, how do you find time to make such elaborate videos while running a company? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I, I try my best to, to just keep it on non-business hours. Obviously sometimes I just get caught up with, with ideas Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I usually do the, the videos on the weekend and try to build up a bunch of different videos and I leave them in my drafts and then I kind of think about which ones were good and then I kind of build on those. I, I realize the weakest content is stuff that you just kind of spontaneously think of mm-hmm. and just without giving it enough thought, you right. just kind of upload it. Um, when I first started doing TikTok, I watched a video uh, from a Korean TikToker. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I should send you his his handle, but he's a, he's obviously someone that has studied film mm-hmm. and just the way he was shooting his TikToks and delivering his jokes. I messaged him as, Oh, this is so awesome. Like I really admire your work. Mm-hmm. And he said, he just said, okay, I mean, all I do is put time and effort into it. And I mean, anything you put time and effort in, even if it's just an eight second video, mm-hmm. people are going to be able to tell the difference. Right. And I think that's made all the differences that I've actually put in more effort. And even if I just thought it was a joke, I could build on top of that, maybe shoot it at a better angle or Mm -hmm. speak in a more softer tone or a different tempo. It's made all the difference. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. People can really tell when there's effort and tender love and care put into a video rather than, you know, just shooting out whatever you can think of. That makes a lot of sense. (laughs) There's definitely a lot of viral videos that are just spontaneously. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And you see those people, but the thing that they lack is consistency because they thought that this type of style would be successful, but it's good for one video, two videos. And once your vibe dies down and you don't have that consistency or, or work ethic to put in some work into your videos, it, it doesn't last long. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. very true. That's Unless exactly you continue what... to shake your butt on TikTok. Yes. And your <laughs> model, then that I hope you never find my handle, Jay. <laughs> 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 yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's exactly what Brian and I were saying too. Some people actually come out with one video when it blows up and it's because, you know, it probably resonates with a lot of people, but you know, afterwards you can see that it starts to trend down a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Cause when, yeah. when your video blows up, they see all, all your other videos yeah. and you see the mm-hmm. same consistency mm-hmm. and all that. Okay. I'm, now I'm a fan. Yeah. You know, yeah. whereas you blow up and you're like, okay, this guy has <laughs> no consistency, no theme to his, yeah. his profile or, he deserves to follow, but yeah. it won't grow past that next level. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. What is one advice that you can give to an aspiring entrepreneur, Jay? 
I would say, don't be afraid to pivot mm -hmm. and like what Maggie said, don't be about saving face. And I think a, a big thing of our generation is we're so influenced by social media and the identity that we portray on social media. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the main reasons why I stepped away from Facebook, Instagram in 2011 was because I saw that it was influencing my ability to pivot. Right. I have a lot of teammates um, from college that all their Instagram, all their Facebook posts were about being a professional basketball player, basketball this, basketball that. Mm -hmm. And it was so apparent that in their career, it was over mm -hmm. and they should be starting to pivot and doing something more sustainable. But they just couldn't because a part of it was an attachment to their identity as on social media. Mm -hmm. They wanted to still be the basketball player. They couldn't all of a sudden be, I don't know, a, 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 a a restaurant owner because that was just too too drastic of a change for their identity right. so I, there should definitely be a huge emotional and mental detachment from social media when deciding things and pivoting in your own life mm -hmm. that's really really good advice yeah. thank okay. you jay yeah thank you for that sound advice well it was amazing learning about you and hearing your amazing story how can our listeners learn more about you online um, I mean, you can follow us on TikTok and Instagram. If you want to message us, um, definitely on Instagram would be the most, the easiest way to message us. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, I guess I'll leave my, my, that information with you guys. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We'll include it inside our show notes. We definitely will. Well, thank you so much, Jay. It was awesome having you on the show. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Maggie, Brian, I appreciate you guys. Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe to the show. We would like to get to the top 10 on iTunes, so be sure to leave us a five-star review. We release an episode every single Wednesday, so stay tuned. Thank you guys so much.